Good morning. And it's good to be back. Uh, thank Dr. Joe for filling in the last two Sundays so that I could go see my kids. And then uh, right before I was going to see my kids, my sister calls me and says that they were planning a 14-day trip to Estonia to visit um, their son and daughter-in-law and granddaughter. I had no idea where Estonia was. Um, and the town they live in is on the very north end of Estonia. And if you think about it, you go across the water and you're in Helsinki, Finland. I think she said the highs were like 25 degrees there, so it was very cold, but she got up there, and so I was able to get out there and make sure my 93-year-old mother's routine was not upset for the well, time I was out there, so thank you. Uh, but unfortunately, um, I've got to fly back out this week. Um, Y'all have been praying for my sister-in-law. She passed away on Friday. She was doing better, and then Thursday, Wednesday night, Thursday morning, she took a turn for the worse. They thought they had her stabilized, and then Friday she passed away. So her funeral service is going to be this Thursday. There'll be a, a kind of viewing on Wednesday, so I'm going to fly up uh, Tuesday night, go to the service, and then come back Friday. So uh, just keep my family in your prayers. I really appreciate that. But next Sunday we have our cantata. So this is going to be a fun time. So invite your neighbors, invite your friends. It'll be a wonderful time in music. And at this time, if you could sign the attendance pass and pass them down, that would be great. Thank you for doing that. And if you could draw a line and write 11, that would be also um, good to help the person who inputs that. Our prayer focus this week is for our neighbors, to pray for our neighbors. And as you're praying for your neighbors, then take the opportunity to go invite them next Sunday to come to our cantata, because it's a wonderful time to invite them. Not only are we going to have the choir sing, but we're going to have the cookie walk. If you get here early, you'll be able to go over there and get all your cookies. It's a fundraiser for our preschool. So if you come about 10, 15, 10, 30, you can go over there and fill up a big thing of cookies and support our preschool. It's a wonderful time. So we've got a lot going on next week. Our poinsettia orders are due today. If you would like one in memory or honor somebody, we need that today. If you forgot your money, just make sure you tear off the thing on the bulletin and put it in there. And as I said, the cantata's next Sunday. And we have the angel tree going. I think we got seven more children to, to get gifts for. And we really need those back next Sunday. So if you have it in your heart to do that, we've, a bunch of them have already gone out. And I thank you because we've already done a lot of things. We did $350 in gift cards to the children's home. Uh, you know, we did 49 shoe boxes. We did 30 Christmas, I mean Thanksgiving baskets, so y'all have done a lot, so thank you so much for that. But we still have seven children we would like to help this Christmas. And we're still looking for the um, college students the, that are away. Uh, we got one name in, but I know we have several other kids that are off to college, and we, won't want, to, we want to be able to write them this spring, let them in words of encouragement. So if you, can, if you have someone who's away at college, please let us know. And the nomads are coming in January. It's right around the corner. If you know of any neighbor that you see that needs work done around their house that they can't get it done or you've got something that you can't get done, get with Frank and we'll put it on the list and get that work scheduled for this coming January through March. And the last thing is, at the end of this service, those who can, we need to move the altar for next Sunday for... Uh, we're having the kids sing at the first service, the choir. We want to be able to see them without this. So I need four people to come at the end of the service to help me move this thing. We just put it on a cart and wheel it back there. So if you can, please do that. And with that, let us prepare our hearts and minds for the worship of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you. 
So this time we invite the Lawrence family to come up and light the Advent candle. And so John came, baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now Eden will light the purple candle. We light this candle as a symbol of Christ the way. May the word sent from God through the prophets lead us to the way of salvation. O come, O come, Emmanuel. At this time, let us stand for a call to worship. what is good. And God's footsteps will show our way. Good job. And let's continue standing and uh, singing God's praises this morning with number 229, Infant Holy, Infant, Infant Holy, Infant Lowly. Please join me in speaking our Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting.
be seated. We now come to that time where we lift up our prayer requests and our praises. Any praises this morning? Yes. Well, that's a good thing that your daughter came, picked you up for Thanksgiving since your wife had to work and drive all the way from High Springs and put you back and hopefully you had a wonderful Thanksgiving with family. That's always a praise. Other praises? Yes. Yes, they need it. You, you just took part of my sermon away. <laughs> That's all right. It's a precursor. <laughs> yes. I had a gentleman come up to me as I was waiting in a fast food in a Chinese restaurant for my food and give me a Christmas card gift. A total stranger. We still have people Yes. Yep, and that's a, it's a blessing when people do that, and we're called to be that blessing sometimes. Yes. Yes. I have my 93-year-old mother for two months from Michigan, and so we'll be coming here during the time she's visiting. Well, it's glad to have you we're with us. We're very grateful she's with us. Yes, that's why I was out visiting my 93-year-old mother for... And it's a blessing that she's still with us. Other praises? Any prayer request? Yes. I have a grandson and his wife who both are on active duty with the IDF in Israel. So I would ask for prayers for their sake. Yeah, we will pray for them and just continued prayers for that whole region and everything that's going on. It's heartbreaking to see some of the things. I'd like first to my nephew, Ken Cook, in Michigan. He's having his stomach removed on December 12th. We will keep him in our prayers. Uh, I'd like us to pray for our friend Kevin, who suffered a heart attack and is now going to have an angioplasty and a stent. So maybe that's a Right there. Yes, that they found something and it wasn't, sometimes something bad happens, has to happen for something good to happen. I always remember that, that sometimes we think it's bad news. Like my mother-in-law got the bad news one time that she had lung uh, cancer, uh, or no, that she had breast cancer, a small, small tumor. And when they went in to um, do this prep for the um, little breast cancer removed the little thing, they found out she had lung cancer. And if she had not had the little lump in the breast cancer, they would have never found the lung cancer, which would have been more serious. So sometimes God faps us upside the head to, <laughs> because he knows there's something going on. Yes.
Yes, and yes, and it's, it's good to pray. And I know we got a couple people that don't want to really share it, but then we've got several that have got procedures coming up in the next few weeks, uh, this week, and then I think the first of January. So we need to just keep people in their prayers all the time. Just God knows who they are, but we just need to pray. So let us go to Lord in prayer. Grace, Heavenly Father, as we come before you this morning, we are so grateful. Grateful for your love, the comfort you provide us. And Lord, you call us to go and to be a neighbor, to love our neighbor, to witness to our neighbor, to comfort our neighbor, to be a friend. And so, Lord, this week, help us to be that good neighbor, not just this week, but all the time. Open our eyes to our neighbors. Because, Lord, some of the people have lived next to us and we really don't know them. Lord, help us to see that everyone we meet and go about in our daily routine is our neighbor. So, Lord, help us to share with them your love. Help us to live a life that shows them that there is a way of peace because we want to be your hands and feet, Lord. So help us to be that neighbor. And Lord, as we come here this morning, you've heard the request, you've heard our praises, but you've also heard our, our concerns for those that are hurting, that need healing, that are having surgery coming up. Lord, you know their needs better than we, but Lord, we know that you are the one who can touch them. You are the one who heals, who brings comfort, who restores. So be with each one there, Lord. And we Lord, we also lift up everyone on our prayer list because they need your, your comfort, your healing, your strength. And we even now, Lord, lift up to you that one name, that one request that is silent in our heart that we name before you now. And gracious Heavenly Father, we do lift up this congregation, this church, your people. And Lord, we want to walk in your ways. We want to be your comfort in a hurting world. Lord, this is strange times we live in with so many people angry, so many people hurting. Too many young people wanting to end their life before it ever started. Lord, help us to be your church of hope. Help us to be a church that goes and gives itself away. Helps us to be a church that loves sacrificially as you have sacrificially loved us by giving us your son. Lord, we want to walk in your ways. We want to be your comfort to the people here in this community. Because Lord, we know that when we begin to transform the lives of our neighbors, we transform the lives of our cities. And when we transform the lives of our city, it becomes a transformation of our state and our nation. So Lord, help us to be that kind of people that go and give of themselves to love and continue to open our eyes to the ways that we might love our neighbor. And Lord, we thank you for the precious gift of Jesus Christ who makes all of this possible, who showed us how to love, who showed us the love of the Father, who gave his life for us, but rose again to offer us eternal life and gave us the strength to live and taught us to pray the prayer we now pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And at this time, we invite our children to head off to Children's Church. They'll go through the double doors there, and they'll return at the end of the service. And we will continue worshiping. Let's sing together with hymn number 218, It Came Upon the Midnight Clear. Oh, oh, oh. 
We're now come to that time where we lift up our tithes and offerings. We're still putting the offerings in the baskets in the back. Normally I talk and then pray, but I'm going to pray and then talk so that the bell players have a time to get up there without walking during the prayer. So let us pray. Oh God, you are such a good God. You love us even when we don't deserve it. It never ends. Your blessings never stop. Your goodness is always surrounding us. Lord, even though we don't always acknowledge it, we miss the blessings. We don't thank you. You continue to love us. You continue to bless us. And we are so grateful. And so, Lord, now as we come and return a portion of that blessing back to you in the form of these, our tithes and offerings, multiply them for your kingdom and guide us in their use. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As I said, I do want to I usually want to thank you all for your faithfulness in supporting the church. Because without your work, we couldn't do so many things. And we've done so much good here in the last weeks. Like I said, we've got all the, the um, angel tree. We've just got seven children left. But you all have faithfully done that. We did $350 in gift cards to those residents of the children's home to make their lives better. We did 49 shoe boxes for the goods, uh, for, um, to send those out and 30 baskets. Y'all are generous, and I thank you for that. And our giving in November was back down. um, We had a deficit in November, and it probably looks like every dollar we spend from this point on to the end of the year will come out of our reserves. It doesn't matter whether it's payroll, electric, missions, or whatever. It's going to come down to there. And we plan for years like this. For the last six years, I know, since I've been here, we've been building up a surplus because we know these happen. And so that enables us to react gently, not knee-jerkly, and have to go do things. And so I just try and be as transparent as I can, and going into the next year, we'll know how we're doing and whether this trend continues or not, and if we have to make some tough decisions or not. But the main thing you can do is just to continue to be faithful. It'd be nice if everyone could just write a check, but the main thing we need to do is just continue to be faithful, to continue to be present. We let so much of this world interfere with our devotion to God 
our ability to be with people. So I encourage you, the way we can continue to be a church is to be a faithful church, reaching out and giving of ourselves. And I've turned around churches that had no money where ad teams, the, the meetings were tough because when we would meet as a church council, we were voting on what bills to pay. We're not there. But when they said, we need to give money away, and I said, how we can't even pay our bills, how are we gonna give it away? I said, we're gonna give away what we don't have. And God blesses that. In our own life, when you give away what you have and don't try to hold on, God blesses it. So I just call you to continue to be faithful to this church because this community needs the church. So thank you. Our scripture this morning comes from the prophet Isaiah, the 40th chapter, beginning the first verse. Hear now these words. Comfort, oh comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, 
and all people shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out, and I said, what shall I cry? All people are grass, their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our Lord will stand forever. Get up, you, to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead the mother sheep. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Have you ever noticed how peculiar people we are? That we do some strange and weird things sometimes, especially when we're young and we think we're invincible. Some years back, there was a story in the newspapers this time of year, about a young Romeo in France who was trying to woo his girlfriend. And since it was Christmas time, he figured he would do it in a Christmas way. See, her parents were out of town. So he figured he could sneak into their, her house and surprise her, and he would do it Santa Claus style and come down the chimney. Unfortunately, most young people don't realize how narrow the flue is in a chimney, and he got stuck. And he had to cry out, and his girlfriend heard him and called the firemen. And when they came, they had to tear down half of the chimney to get him out. I'm sure he made a great impression on her families. All I can say about that story is I suggest that you do not climb down a chimney unless your name is Santa Claus, and you've got it down. But not only are we peculiar people, but we're also a hurting people. Many are suffering. Many are wondering when this suffering will end or when life will have meaning. Too many are like sheep without a shepherd. They don't know where to go, how to act. And if you think back to just this past year, the news you have read in this past years, it's not comforting. It shows that we live in a not only a hurting world, but a violent world. I like the way someone put it. He said, every time we think we have ascended the mountain and that humanity is capable of building a paradise on earth, we read a story that breaks our hearts. And every time we begin to think pretty highly of ourselves that we live in a civilized world, there comes along another massacre or war or some other tragedy. Well, on this second week of Advent, we shift our thinking from the promised hope of the second coming to the love that God displayed for us in sending his only son. So we turn to the 40th chapter of Isaiah where we hear these words to a suffering world. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. This chapter is an interesting mark in the book of Isaiah. It's a shift in the way Isaiah has been speaking. Up to this point, Isaiah has been calling the people to repentance, that doom is coming, that bad things are happening. If we turn back just to the 39th chapter, one chapter back, we find the story of Hezekiah, one of the kings of Judah before the Israelites were overthrown by the Babylonians. And Hezekiah has received some envoys from the king of Babylon's son. And Hezekiah not only receives this man, he, he takes him all over the palace, he takes him into the armory and says, here's all the weapons I have, here's all the horses I have, here's all the soldiers I have, here's my treasury and all the money I have. And then they leave. And Isaiah comes up to King Hezekiah and comes, you know, that was a stupid thing you just did. <laughs> and because you were showing your arrogance and other things, your own descendants, your own flesh and blood will be taken from you. 
will be taken into captivity, that bad things are coming. In other words, Isaiah doesn't paint a pretty picture for the Israelites' future. And Hezekiah gives one of those weird responses. He responds to this dreadful prophecy prophecy by Isaiah in the strangest way. He says, you know, the word of the Lord you have spoken is good. For he thought there will be peace and security in my lifetime. I think we have a lot of people who think that way, especially politicians. They think, no, it's not going to happen until later after I'm retired. Social Security is going to go bankrupt in 2030, but I won't be a politician then, so I don't have to do anything today. That's the thinking of Hezekiah. It's the thinking of too many people. We don't worry about what we're doing today to cause suffering later. But as we leave the 39th chapter and we begin to move into the 40th chapter, we find that the Israelites have been taken into captivity. They have suffered for much, for turning away from God. The temple has been destroyed, the city has been looted, and the people have been taken from their homes, and they're wondering, where is God in all of this turmoil, this suffering? And it's what I hear today. Where is God in all the chaos that we read about today? Because I think we live in a world that is similarly filled with shattered lives, people who feel that all hope has been taken from and they wonder where God is. I think one of the signs that we've been trending this way is if we look at one little statistic. In 1967, some of y'all may remember that. I was only 10 years old. But in 1967, there were only 45,000 counselors in the United States. By 1992, that number had risen to 208,000, a 450% increase in one generation. We're hurting that much. And it's only continued to grow because the pain people are suffering has continued to increase. It truly, as Scripture says, that we are like sheep without a shepherd. And the wonderful part of this passage and its relationship to Christmas is that it once again points out how God takes note of our hurt, how he takes note of our suffering and will not leave us in that suffering. That he will come, that God still cares, even if our suffering is self-inflicted. And Isaiah tells the people that God will send one who will be like a shepherd. And so Isaiah tells the people, you who bring good tidings to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up. Do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. They've been saying, where is God? And he says, here is your God. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power and his arm rules for him. See, his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. And he gathers his lambs in the arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. He comes as that good shepherd. James Dobson in his book, The Life on the Edge, writes about us being compared to sheep because a lot of people don't like to be compared to sheep. Some people say they're smart, but they're pretty dumb because they fall into a herd mentality. And he writes this, what are the characteristics of sheep that remind the Lord of you and me? What is he really saying when he refers to us in that way? Well, shepherds and ranchers tell us that these animals are virtually defenseless against predators. They're not very resourceful, inclined to follow one another into danger. And they are absolutely dependent on their human masters for safety. Thus, when David wrote, we all, like sheep, have gone astray, he was referring to our tendency to move as an unthinking herd and away from the watchful care of the shepherd. That's our problem so often. We get caught up into a herd mentality. And as social media has blossomed in there, our young people are getting caught up in more and more of this herd mentality. We're constantly chasing the latest craze. We see it in home improvement. You've you got to have this kind of countertop, this kind of cabinets, this kind of color, because the old color is passe. The fashion, we're always chasing it. And we're even chasing bad things. And I think one of the reasons today it's so hard is our young people have grown up in a very different world than many of us grew up in. See, ever since September 11, 2001, I think we have too many people who are afraid of life than ever before. Our children have grown up with this sense of heightened security of everyone wary of one another instead of everyone loving one another. 
And so we're afraid to live. Life has become so bad in some people's mind that statistics now say that suicide is the third leading cause of death among those 15 to 25 years of age. It's the sixth leading cause of death among those 5 to 14. As I've read those statistics, I can, could only imagine thinking, how can a five-year-old's life be so bad that they want to kill themselves? And these are not isolated incidents. It's estimated that 500,000 teenagers every year try to kill themselves. And 5,000 succeed. That's right up there with how many are killed with cancer and homicide. And the strange thing, when you read it out into it, most of these teenagers do not want to die. They want to live. They are crying out for help. They want love. They want acceptance. And I have come to see that people will do the most crazy, self-destructive things just to be loved, just to be accepted by a group. Our gangs flourish because they love kids who are outcast. They love them and accept them and then ask them to do heinous things. And they do it because they want that love. We are the church are called to be that love. Sometime back, a staff writer for the Miami Herald named Madeline Blass wrote, read an obituary of a young woman named Judy Bucknell. Madeline turned the name over in her mind several times. She sat there wondering, who was Judy Bucknell? Madeline, for some strange reason, wanted to know about this obituary. So she checked the police report on Judy Bucknell. It was homicide number 106 of the year. That's what the report said, killed. June 9th, 11.42 p.m., stabbed seven times, strangled, age 38, weighed 109 pounds, Judy Bucknell. Under normal circumstances, Judy Bucknell's life would have disappeared with her obituary. Except for two things. One was reporter Madeline's curiosity about who this woman was. And the other was Judy Bucknell's diary, which Madeline got hold of. There she heard Judy tell of her worries, worries about getting old, about getting fat, about getting pregnant, about getting by. And yet for all the purposes, she looked like she had it all. She lived in the stylish Coconut Grove in Miami. That's where people live in Miami if they're lonely, but they want to act happy. But Judy was confused about her life. Half of her life was a fantasy, the other half was a nightmare. She was successful in her job as a secretary, but a loser at love. Listen to what she wrote in her diary. The hurt she shares. Where are the men with flowers and champagne and music? Where are the men who call and ask for a genuine, actual date? Where are the men who would like to share more than your bed, my booze, my food? I would like to have in my life once before I pass through my life the kind of sexual relationship which is part of a loving relationship. She never did. She wasn't a prostitute. She wasn't on drugs. She wasn't on welfare. She never went to jail. She wasn't a social outcast. She was respectable. She jogged. She hosted parties. She wore designer clothes and had an apartment that overlooked the bay. And she was hurting. And she was very lonely. In her diary, she wrote this, I see people together and I'm so jealous, I want to throw up. What about me? What about me? She was surrounded by people, yet she lived like she was on an island. Many acquaintances, but few friends. Many lovers, but little love. She wrote, who is going to love Judy Bucknell? I feel so old, so unloved, so unwanted, so abandoned, so used up. I want to cry and sleep forever. And on June 9th, 1980, someone put her to sleep, crying. And Judy's diary whimpered softly, unfilled pages aching for what might have been. And we like to think that maybe her case is an isolated case, and unfortunately, it's all too common. Too many people are hurting like Judy Bucknell hurt. And God sees that pain in our lives. And that is why he sent his son. That is what Isaiah was trying to tell the people. God sees your misery. And he sent his son to help. As the church, we must share this good news that there is hope. 
but we're not. We're keeping it all bottled up inside here. Instead of going out joyous, sharing with people, loving people, being a living example of the love we have. Advent season is the beginning of the Christian year. The Christian year doesn't start January 1st. It starts with the first Sunday in Advent because we, we start looking forward to the hope of Christ. And for this Christian year, our vision for this church, this congregation, must be about sharing the hope we have. We can't keep it silent. We must because people are suffering like Judy was suffering. And they're simply putting on masks and walking out the door, facing each day afraid. And they're doing that because pain is always private. Proverbs, you know, says, he who laughs, laughs with others, but he who weeps, weeps alone. Judy Bucknell laughed with the crowds at the party. She laughed with the men who dated her, 59 lovers in 56 months, according to her diary. She laughed at the office. She laughed at the coffee shop. She laughed with her boss at work. But when she came home, she wept alone over her diary. I'm alone, she wrote, and I want to share something with somebody that is our problem outside the church. People are wanting to share. They're in pain. And we have something to share with them, something of vital importance, something of hope. I know this sounds like a drag on Christmas day season, but it's our calling because that's the world we're living in. It's a hurting, suffering world that needs the hope of Christ, and we are the ambassadors to that hope. We are called to, as Isaiah said, comfort. See, comfort is different. Comfort is always communal. We in the church need to be about sharing the comfort we have, the the comfort that Isaiah shared, the comfort that Christ came to bring as a shepherd to his flock. If pain is always private, then comfort is always communal, and we are to be about that. Those who weep can't be comforted unless a hand reaches out to them, unless that hand reaches over a fence, across a doorstep, across the barriers that are put up. That is our calling because that is what Christ did for us and he calls us to go and to love because there's a hurting and confused world out there. And I close with this observation because if you read the news and you look at the craziness out there, you see a lot in a lot of our campuses there that young people are calling for us to live by Shahira law with Islam and all that that's going up and I don't even think they understand what they're calling for. And as I thought about that, what came to mind is the image of Mecca. I don't know if you've ever seen there the people walking around the big cube building in the center of the city that's called the Kaaba. And as they walk around, that one corner has a stone in it. And they believe this is a very sacred stone. It's a stone they believe that came down from heaven. And as they walk around, they want to try and get over to that corner and touch it. And I bring this up not to poke a fun at Islam or the faith, but just to point out something that contradicts with our faith. See, we do not worship a stone that came down from heaven. We worship a son who came down from heaven to offer us comfort, to offer us hope. We are people of hope, people of peace. And that's what we're supposed to be about. And if you are here today or listening in today and wondering, but where's my hope? Where's my peace? Where's my love? Know that God loves you. He sent his son to die for you. And that we as a church are here to love you if you will just let us know. But if you are here today and you already know that love and you've received that love, then God is reminding you to proclaim it from the mountaintop, to not keep it bottled up, to prepare the way of the Lord for those who are searching, those who are hurting, like Judy was searching but no one reached out. We are called to be that one who reaches out, who loves. Let us pray. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you of your never-ending love. Your goodness is always there. And you have called us to be your ambassadors of peace, your witnesses of hope, your instruments of grace. 
Just as we receive grace, it is supposed to flow through us, Lord, and that's hard sometimes because we get caught up in our own stuff. But you have called us to love, to give of that love. And so fill us with that power of the Holy Spirit so that we can be that church that leaves here today and shares the hope with a hurting world because, Lord, it is crazy out there. You know better than we, and, but you are sending us into that crazy world, so strengthen us to be your witnesses. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you please stand together for our closing hymn, number 234, O Come, All Ye Faithful. Just a quick reminder, I need four people to help me move the altar at the end of this. And as we go, let us reach up and grab God's hand because he's not going to let you go. He's going to walk with you wherever you go and give you comfort and peace. So go in his hand, go in his strength, and go in his love and love your neighbor and love the world. Amen.